all the cool kids, they're doing rocketry stuff. And I want to be a cool kid too. Joe's working on a space shot. Xyla just hit Mach 2.2. Charlie is mixing up spicy cookie dough and keg rocket. Well, he's building a keg rocket. Now, unlike the aforementioned individuals, I am not an engineer. And in fact, I have very little in the way of skills or knowledge needed to tackle a rocketry project. So you may be asking yourself, breaking taps, pray tell, why dost thou embark upon thy project? And while I would be somewhat concerned about your pattern of speech, I would highlight two important qualifications. Number one, I have a YouTube channel, which is like half the battle, am I right? And number two, I have the naive optimism of someone who doesn't fully understand what they're committing to. And honestly, what else do you need? Now, all jokes aside, I've been wanting to dip my toe in amateur rocketry for a while now, and I figured I'd start with a hybrid rocket. We don't use hybrids though, because hybrids are trash. I, yeah, no, I mean, hybrids are, hybrids are dumb. That's stupid. Who would, who would want to do it? So I figured I'd start with a monopropellant thruster. No particular reason for a monopropellant, it just kind of sounded like a fun project. The plan is to build an electric pump-fed, silver-catalyzed hydrogen peroxide thruster. I'll break that all down in a second, but basically we're going to put hydrogen peroxide in one end and a hot steam will come out the other. Today we're going to look at the injector geometry with a high-speed camera, but first we need a little bit of background just to understand what's going on here. There are a few categories of rocket engines. The most common are bipropellant engines that mix liquid fuel and oxidizer. This is probably the kind you've seen if you've ever watched a rocket launch, ever. There are also solid rockets, which are commonly used in amateur rocketry, but also, for example, the boosters on the space shuttle. The propellant contains both a fuel and an oxidizer, but they're mixed together and cured into a solid form. Then there are hybrid rockets, which are a combination of the two, typically a solid fuel and a liquid or gas oxidizer. And then finally, there are monopropellants, which uses a single chemical that decomposes and provides thrust, typically with the help of a catalyst. The catalyst lowers the activation energy enough that the monopropellant just spontaneously decomposes and releases energy. The most common monoprop is hydrazine, which is a very nasty chemical. But there are other monoprops too, like hydrogen peroxide. Because the reaction is a decomposition instead of ignition, monopropellants are less energetic than either bipropellant engines or solid rockets. But they are simple relatively safe to store for long durations, and generally pretty reliable. For example, the Perseverance lander used them on the hover stage when landing on Mars. Okay, so that's enough general background. Let's dig into my design a little bit. This is a 3D printed two-scale model of what we're gonna build. So you can see there are four different components here in different colors, and each of these will represent a different machined item that will be bolted together into the assembly. So in the bottom, we have the injection chamber. The hydrogen peroxide will enter through this tapped hole here and fill up this cavity where it will meet an injection plate, not pictured here, but it goes between the green and the blue. That injection plate will have nozzles of different sizes and geometry and be designed to spread the peroxide out into a fine atomized spray, which will fill up this green section in the middle. The orange section is the catalyst chamber, and this will be packed with some kind of silver catalyst, which will decompose the peroxide. I'm planning to use 35% hydrogen peroxide, which exothermically decomposes into oxygen gas and water vapor when it makes contact with a catalyst. 35% is on the high end for home use. You won't really find it at the pharmacy, but it's very much on the low end for rocketry. Rockets and thrusters use what's known as high test peroxide, which is typically 70 to 90%. The reason for this is basically because water takes a lot of energy to boil. So up until about 68%, there's not enough energy in the peroxide to boil all the water that's present. This means temperatures won't exceed 100 degrees Celsius, pressures are limited, and the output is basically a wet steam. But above that threshold, all the water is vaporized and there's excess energy, leading to increased chamber temperature and pressures, which is what you want for a high performance thruster. The only downside is that high test peroxide is very sensitive and likes to blow up. So, you know, there's that. At 35%, we should expect something that's closer to like a moderately spicy steam generator rather than a rocket output. Still, I'm kind of curious how much thrust we can generate even with a low percentage. 
For a catalyst, I'm planning on using silver, which has been sputtered onto wire mesh. But I'm also looking into a few other options as well, like making my own silver foam. And then at the top, obviously, is the rocket nozzle, where the compressed gases will hit this choke point and then spread out, hopefully to uh, generate a little bit of thrust. Now you can see there are some holes in different locations. There's a hole down at the bottom, there's one that goes out the back here and here, and then there's some up on the sides. There will be temperature and pressure sensors on all four of the chambers so that we can get uh, an idea of what's going on inside of this thing. There is also a hole here, which is off to the side of the chamber. This is for an integrated heater to help get the catalyst up to temperature. Since we're working with relatively low percentage peroxide, it honestly doesn't decompose that well in presence of a catalyst, and there'll be a lot of water that has to boil off. So by preheating the catalyst, we'll have a better chance of this doing something interesting. And then over here, this is just a tank, which will hold the hydrogen peroxide. It's about 200 milliliters, and there's nothing fancy about this. It's just a block of aluminum with, you know, a funnel at the bottom. The last component is the electric pump feed. Basically, this just means I'm going to make an electric turbine compressor to pump the peroxide instead of using pressurized gas. This is going to be a bit of a project, so today we're just going to focus on the injector geometry, and the rest we'll tackle in future videos. The peroxide needs to make physical contact with the catalyst to decompose. So the goal is to spread it as evenly as possible across the catalyst, and this is done with injectors. With the help of my CNC, I made a little test rig to try out different injector geometries. So we can see here, this is the injection chamber down at the bottom. Not split in half, obviously. But we've got the chamber inside, two ports leading into the center. This is a temperature on this side, and this is a pressure sensor over here. There's a compression fitting on the bottom for the fluid inlet, and then an O-ring to seal it against the next stage. I also have the tank, you can see here, with a push fit air connection on top, and then a compression fitting on the bottom, and a stainless steel tube. This is kind of a temporary arrangement. Uh, the real one won't have a push fit connector, but for now it's easier to test just off shop air, making this a pressure fed device. Okay, so here is the setup as it currently stands. I've got my high-speed camera here in the middle and the test subject up here. This is the injection chamber with a tank back on the side, and it's just kind of jury-rigged in a position that makes it easy enough for filming. And then I've got a high-intensity lamp over here and another one over here, uh, which will move a little closer when we start filming. The tank is just pressure-fed right now from shop air, and I can adjust how much pressure is going into the tank to see how that affects the injectors. First up is what's called a shower head injector. It's basically just an array of holes like your shower, and it spreads the fuel, oxidizer, or monopropellant. A full shower head would have holes across the entire disc, but I used a single row so it'd be easier to see on camera. I started with one millimeter holes and tried out a few different pressures. This was all filmed at 4,500 frames per second. At low pressure, we can see that the liquid is ejected rather sedately. And as the pressure increases, you can see more atomization happening due to the interaction between the edge of the hole and the liquid. It also becomes more uneven, although this is complicated a little bit by some air entering the system and mixing with the fluid. The other variety that I want to try is called an impinging injector. This angles two holes towards each other so the streams of liquid collide in midair. This helps atomize the streams, and in the case of bipropellants, it also helps mix the fuel in the oxidizer. My first plate was completely useless, <laughs> because the holes didn't line up. Uh, this is entirely my fault, I just wasn't careful on the CNC when I was milling it, so the drills walked around a little bit and ended up in the wrong location. After fixing this, I found out that the geometry is just, well, it's just bad. <laughs> the holes are too large, they're too close together, and the angle that they intersect each other is, is not a good angle. So all in all, you end up with a single stream kind of merging together rather than it atomizing. With some encouragement and help from the internet, I remade these with smaller holes. The next set of plates are using 0.2 millimeters instead of one millimeter. First, I just wanna take a moment to appreciate how much smaller 0.2 is compared to one millimeter. Like I know intellectually that it's smaller, but 
when you actually see them, there is a big difference in these two sizes. So quick update on the setup here. I've added some thermal shielding to my camera and this uh, pressure sensor over here. They're just small pieces of uh, aluminum. And basically the intensity of the light, it was so hot that everything was starting to get pretty warm and I was afraid of melting my camera lens. I also added this piece of blue aluminum as a backdrop behind the uh, setup, which just helps with contrast a little bit. It's a lot easier to see the water spray against a colored background, which I learned, as opposed to this white background. I'm also using a different lens. I found my macro lens, and this is a lot better than the macro slider that I was using before. This is great to get up close, but the more you, you know, ratchet this out, the less light you get. So it starts to become really problematic in a high speed setup like this. So the macro lens is much better. The linear shower head design shows much more laminar flow, even at high pressures compared to before. And it's interesting, whereas the first set of holes at high pressure completely atomized, here it stays pretty laminar even up to 60 psi. The impinging injector worked much better. Honestly, it's just gorgeous footage. I can't believe how cool this looks. The streams are angled at 90 degrees this time, and when combined with the smaller hole size, the atomization is a ton better. This kind of injector has been studied a lot, and we can see some of the more notable features in the literature. The two streams first merge and form what's called a liquid sheet. The sheet region is a lot easier to see from a side view. And here we can see that it's basically a teardrop-shaped laminar flow region. A little further away from this sheet, it starts to break up into large strings called ligaments. And then finally, those ligaments break up into individual droplets. The sheet formation is really noticeable at the beginning when the pressure is low. If we bump up the frame rate to 20,000 frames per second, the ligament breakup is a little easier to see. Although even at this speed, it's tough to make out because it happens so quickly. And the resolution is quite poor, which doesn't help. Finally, I want to see a test with a full shower head and impinging injector so that we can see how it behaves rather than these more minimal versions. The full shower head behaves a lot differently than the single row, which I honestly wasn't expecting. At low pressures, most of the streams sort of merge together to make one big large flow of liquid. And the high pressure test just isn't really that useful to look at, unfortunately. The increased flow rate from all these holes emptied the tank really quickly at high pressure. And that introduced a lot of air into the mix when it was happening, which makes it difficult to interpret the results. The full-scale impinging injector behaves a little better because it doesn't have as many holes, so the flow rate is a little more restricted. It seems to do a pretty good job atomizing the liquid. It's hard to make out most of the impinging regions because they're obscured by all the mist, but if we zoom in on a few spots around the edge of the injector, we can see that the streams are impacting and atomizing pretty well. If we swap over to a complete profile view, we can get a better understanding of the spray characteristics. How far it goes, how much it spreads out, how well atomized it is. The divisions on the ruler at the top are in millimeters to give a sense of scale. Although in a couple of the tests, it becomes pretty obvious that the jets aren't receiving equal pressure. The ones in the center start up first, and they seem to get more pressure, while the ones along the outside starve and pulsate more. We can actually see at a few points where a hole gets clogged, and that really ruins the impinging effect, because if you don't have the opposite side of the doublet, you don't get any impinging, you just get a single stream shooting off into nowhere. So that really highlights kind of how fragile the impinging injectors are, and they need to be working in perfect order for it to atomize as you expect. All in all, this was a very informative exercise, and I learned a lot about how these react under different conditions and scenarios. It's still hard to say what will work best though. A combustion system, for example, wants even finely atomized spray so that it ensures a good mixing with the oxygen. But since the peroxide needs to make physical contact with the metal catalyst, rather than mixing with the air for combustion, it's not entirely clear if atomization is actually all that important. A nice, consistent, even stream from the shower head might end up being more effective and robust than the impinging injectors. 
And the flow rate's much better because you can just put more holes in. So that might end up being a winner, even though it's not as finely divided of a spray. But that's just something we'll have to play as we go along. We won't really know how it performs until we have a catalyst to start spraying this against. My original plan was to publish a single video at the end of the project, showcasing the entire build from start to finish. But I just don't really think that's gonna work. This video alone was already 35 to 40 minutes before editing. So instead, we're gonna do this in chunks and we'll just see how it goes. Now, if you're interested in those technical details, there's a 20 minute companion video up on Nebula now. It's a less scripted discussion about material compatibility, manufacturing, sensor selection, catalyst choices, and some of the details about the electric pump feed that I'm working on for the next video. I think the information is interesting, but it really slowed this video down too much, so I ended up cutting it. I've talked about Nebula some in the past, and you've probably seen it mentioned on other channels like Practical Engineering and Real Engineering. Nebula is a creator-owned and operated streaming service that focuses on high-quality educational videos. A bunch of your favorite creators release videos ad-free on Nebula, as well as including additional bonus content. For example, Brian from Real Engineering released a behind-the-scenes tour of his hypersonic U-Haul video. Because there's no algorithm to please, the extra video can really take its time and show a lot of interesting details that were also cut from his main video that ended up on YouTube. It's a great example of things that we can do on Nebula that we can't easily publish on YouTube. Nebula also has classes from your favorite creators and exclusive high-quality original videos. Nebula is a subscription service, but part of that subscription goes directly to help support my channel. My McMaster car bill is already getting unpleasantly high for this project, and we're only one video in, so any help is truly appreciated. If you sign up using the link down below, you can support this channel and get both Nebula and Nebula classes for 40% off. That works out to a little over $2.50 a month if you choose the annual plan. So yeah, if any of that sounds interesting, there are links down below. Thanks for watching, and I'll see you next time.